The Buddha Speaks of Amitabha Sutra. Commentary by the Venerable Master Xuanhua. According to the instructions of the Tiantai School, sutras are outlined according to fivefold profound meanings: explaining the name, describing the substance, clarifying the principle, discussing the function, and determining the teaching mark. The fivefold meanings are called fivefold because they unfold layer after layer. The first is explaining the name. Only when you know the sutra's name can you begin to understand its principles. Just as when you meet a person, you first learn his name. So it is with sutras, for each has its own particular name. The titles of all Buddhist sutras may be divided into two parts: the common title and the special title. The special title of this sutra is "The Buddha Speaks of Amitabha," and the word "sutra" is the common title, as all discourses spoken by the Buddha are called sutras. Although five kinds of beings may speak sutras, one, the Buddhas; two, the Buddha's disciples; three. Gods, four, immortals, and five, transformation beings, that is, gods or Buddhas who transform into human form. The disciples, gods, immortals, and transformation beings must first receive the Buddha's certification before they speak a sutra. Without certification. What they speak is not truly a sutra. This sutra was spoken by the Buddha, not by those in the other four categories. It came from Shakyamuni Buddha's mouth. Because its principles were too profound and wonderful for the Shravakas and Bodhisattvas to comprehend, no one requested the Pure Land Dharma door. Nonetheless, it had to be revealed. And so the Buddha spontaneously spoke this very important sutra, doubly important because it will be the last to disappear in the Dharma ending age. In the future, the Buddha Dharma will become extinct. Demon kings most fear the Sharangama Mantra, and so the Sharangama Sutra will be the first to disappear. For without the sutra. No one will be able to recite the mantra. Then, one by one, the other sutras will disappear. We now have the black words on the text on white paper, but in the future, when the Buddha Dharma is on the verge of extinction, the words will disappear from the page, as all the sutras vanish. The last to go will be the Amitabha Sutra. It will remain in the world an additional hundred years, and ferry limitless living beings across the sea of suffering to the other shore, which is Nirvana. When the Amitabha Sutra has been forgotten, only the great phrase "Namo Amitabha Buddha" will remain among mankind and save limitless beings. Next, the word "Namo." Which is Sanskrit and means homage to will be lost, and only Amitabha Buddha will remain for another hundred years, rescuing living beings. After that, the Buddha Dharma will completely disappear from the world. Because this sutra will be the last to disappear, it is extremely important. Who is the Buddha? The Buddha is the greatly enlightened one. His great enlightenment is an awakening to all things without a particle of confusion. A true Buddha has ended karma and transcended emotions. He is without karmic obstacles, 
and devoid of emotional responses. On the other hand, living beings are attached to emotions and worldly love. Common men with heavy karma and confused emotions are simply living beings. The Buddha's enlightenment may be said to be of three kinds. 1. Basic Enlightenment Enlightenment at the Root Source 2. Beginning Enlightenment The Initial Stages of Enlightenment and 3. Ultimate Enlightenment Complete Enlightenment You can also say that he is 1. Self-Enlightened that he 2. Enlightens others and that he is 3. Complete in enlightenment and practice Self-Enlightenment Common men are unenlightened They think themselves intelligent when they are actually quite dull. They gamble thinking that they will win. Who would have guessed that they'd lose? Why are they so confused? It's because they do things which they clearly know are wrong. The more confused they are, the deeper they sink into confusion. The deeper they sink, the more confused they become. Everyone should become enlightened. The Buddha is a part of all living beings and is one of them himself. But because he is enlightened instead of confused, he is said to be self-enlightened and not like common men. Shravakas, the disciples of the small vehicle, are independents. They are self-enlightened, but they do not enlighten others. Bodhisattvas enlighten others, unlike the Shravakas who think only of themselves. Bodhisattvas choose to benefit all beings and ask for nothing in return. Using their own methods of self-enlightenment, they convert all beings, causing them to realize the doctrine of enlightenment and non-confusion. This is the practice of the Bodhisattva conduct. Shravakas, sound hearers, awaken to the way upon hearing the sound of the Buddha's voice. They cultivate the four holy truths. 1. Suffering 2. Origination 3. Extinction and 4. The Way They also cultivate the twelve causes and conditions. 1. Ignorance which conditions 2. Action Action which conditions 3. Consciousness Consciousness which conditions 4. Name and form Name and form which conditions 5. The six sense organs The six sense organs which condition 6. Contact Contact which conditions 7. Feeling Feeling which conditions 8. Craving Craving which conditions 9. Grasping Grasping which conditions 10. Becoming Becoming which conditions 11. Birth And birth which conditions 12. Old Age and Death The Twelve all arise from ignorance, and ignorance is merely a lack of understanding. Without ignorance, the Twelve Causes and Conditions cease to operate, but if you flounder in ignorance, you are caught in the remaining causes. Those of the small vehicle cultivate the Dharma, but Bodhisattvas transcend all successive stages cultivating the six perfections and the ten thousand practices. The six perfections are 1. Giving Giving transforms those who are stingy. 
Greedy people who can't give should practice giving, for if they do not learn to give, they will never get rid of their stinginess. 2. Morality The precepts are guides to perfect conduct and eliminate offenses, transgressions, and evil deeds. Keep the precepts. 3. Patience Patience transforms those who are hateful. If you have an unreasonable temper, cultivate being patient and bearing with things. Don't be an Ashura, a fighter who gets angry all day and is not on speaking terms with anyone unless it's to speak while glaring with fierce, angry eyes. Be patient instead. 4. Vigor Vigor transforms those who are lazy. If you are lazy, learn to be vigorous. 5. Dhyana meditation. Dhyana meditation transforms those who are scattered and confused. 6. Wisdom. Prajna wisdom transforms those who are stupid. The bright light of wisdom disperses the darkness of stupidity. Bodhisattvas cultivate the six perfections and the ten thousand practices. Self enlightened, they enlighten others and are therefore unlike those of the small vehicle. Complete Enlightenment This is wonderful enlightenment, the enlightenment of the Buddha. The Buddha perfects self enlightenment and the enlightenment of others. And when his enlightenment and practice are complete, he has realized Buddhahood. You keep talking about the Buddha, you say, but I still don't know who the Buddha is. You don't know? I will tell you. You are the Buddha. Then why don't I know it? you ask. Your not knowing is just the Buddha. But this is not to say that you have already reached Buddhahood. You are as yet an unrealized Buddha. You should understand that the Buddha became a Buddha from the stage of a common person. It is just living beings who can cultivate to realize Buddhahood. The Buddha is the enlightened one. And when a living being becomes enlightened, he's a Buddha too. Without enlightenment, he's just a living being. This is a general explanation of the word Buddha. The Buddha has three bodies, four wisdoms, five eyes, and six spiritual penetrations. You may be a Buddha, but you are still an unrealized Buddha, for you do not have these powers. The Buddha cultivated from the stage of a common person to Buddhahood and has all the attributes of Buddhahood. Some who haven't become Buddhas claim to be Buddhas. This is the height of stupidity. Claiming to be what they are not, they cheat themselves and cheat others. Isn't this to be a greatly stupid one? Everyone can become a Buddha, but cultivation is necessary. If one has the three bodies and the four wisdoms, one may call oneself a Buddha. If one has just the five eyes or a bit of spiritual penetrations, one may not. The three bodies are 1. The Dharma body, 2. The reward body, 3. The transformation body. The four wisdoms are 1. The great perfect mirror wisdom, 2. The wonderful observing wisdom. 3. The wisdom of accomplishing what is done. And 4. The equality wisdom. The six spiritual penetrations are 1. The heavenly eye. The heavenly eye can see the gods and watch all their activities. 2. The heavenly ear. 
The heavenly ear can hear the speech and sounds of the gods. Three, the knowledge of others' thoughts. Thoughts in the minds of others which they have not yet spoken are already known. This refers to the present. Four, the knowledge of past lives. With this penetration, one can also know the past. Five, the extinction of outflows. To be without outflows is to have no thoughts of greed, hate, stupidity, or sexual desire. In general, once one gets rid of all one's bad habits and faults, one has no outflows. Outflows are like water running through a leaky bottle. At the stage of no outflows, the leaks have been stopped up. Six, the complete spirit, also called the penetration of the spiritual realm, this is an inconceivably wonderful state. The five eyes. One, the heavenly eye. Two, the Buddha eye. Three. The wisdom eye, four, the Dharma eye, and five, the flesh eye. A verse about the five eyes says, "The heavenly eye penetrates without obstruction; the flesh eye sees obstacles but does not penetrate; the Dharma eye only contemplates the mundane." The wisdom eye understands true emptiness. The Buddha eye shines like a thousand suns. Although the illuminations differ, their substance is one. The heavenly eye penetrates without obstruction and sees the affairs of eighty thousand great eons. It cannot see beyond that. The flesh eye can see those things which are obstructed. The heavenly eye sees only those things which are not obstructed. The Dharma eye contemplates the mundane truth, all the affairs of worldly existence. The wisdom eye comprehends the state of true emptiness, the genuine truth. Not just the Buddha, but everyone has a Buddha eye. Some have opened their Buddha eyes and some have not. The open Buddha eye shines with the blazing intensity of a thousand suns. Although the five eyes differ in what they see, they are basically of the same substance. So the Buddha has three bodies, four wisdoms, five eyes, and six spiritual penetrations. If one has such talent, one may call oneself a Buddha. But if not, one would be better off being a good person instead of trying to cheat people. In this sutra, Shakyamuni Buddha, the teacher of the Saha world, speaks of the adornment of the land of ultimate bliss and of its teacher, Amitabha Buddha. Saha is a Sanskrit word which means. To be endured, the world in which we live has so much suffering that living beings find it hard to endure, and so it is named Saha. Shakyamuni Buddha's name, also Sanskrit, is explained in two parts. Shakya, his family name, means able to be humane. The Buddha shows the humaneness as compassion, which relieves suffering. And kindness, which bestows happiness by teaching and transforming living beings. There are three kinds of compassion. One, an attitude of loving compassion. Average men love and sympathize with those close to them, but not with strangers. Seeing relatives or friends in distress. They exhaust their strength to help them, but when strangers are suffering, they pay them no heed. Having compassion for those you love is called an attitude of loving compassion. 
There is as well an attitude of loving compassion which extends to those of the same species, but not to those of other species. For example, not only do people have no compassion for animals such as oxen, pigs, chickens, geese, or ducks, but they even go so far as to eat animals' flesh. They snatch away animals' lives in order to nourish their own. This is not a true attitude of loving compassion. Fortunately, people rarely eat each other. They may eat pork, mutton, beef, chicken, duck, and fish, but they don't catch, kill, and eat each other. And so they are a bit better off than animals that turn on members of their own species for food. People may not eat each other, but they certainly have no true attitude of loving compassion towards animals. Two, compassion which comes from understanding conditioned dharmas. Those of the small vehicle have compassion which comes from understanding conditioned dharmas, as well as the attitude of loving compassion discussed above. They contemplate all dharmas as arising from causes and conditions. And they know that causes and conditions have no nature; their very substance is emptiness. Contemplating the emptiness of conditioned dharmas, they compassionately teach and transform living beings without becoming attached to the teaching and transforming. They know that everything is empty. Three. The great compassion which comes from understanding the identical substance of all beings. Buddhas and bodhisattvas have yet another kind of compassion. The Buddha's Dharma body pervades all places, and so the Buddhas and bodhisattvas are of one substance with all beings. The Buddha's heart and nature are all pervasive, and all beings are contained within it. We are living beings within the Buddha's heart, and he is the Buddha within our hearts. Our hearts and the Buddha's are the same, everywhere throughout the ten directions: north, east, south, west, the directions in between, above and below. Therefore, the Buddha and living beings are of the same substance without distinction. This is called great compassion. Shakya, the Buddha's family name, includes these three kinds of compassion. If one chose to speak about it in more detail, there are limitless and unbounded meanings. Muni is the Buddha's personal name. It means still and quiet. Still and unmoving, he is silent. No words from the mouth, no thoughts from the mind. This is an inconceivable state. The Buddha speaks Dharma without speaking. He speaks and yet does not speak. Does not speak, and yet he speaks. This is still and silent. Still, still. Silent and unmoving, yet responding in accord, responding in accord, and yet always, always silent and still. This is the meaning of the Buddha's personal name, Muni. All Buddhas have the name Buddha in common, but only this Buddha has the special name Shakyamuni. Continuing the explanation of the title, we shall now investigate the meaning of "speak." In Chinese, the word "speak" (shuo) is made up of the radical "yan," which means word, and the element "dui." Dui has two dots on the top, which were originally the word "ren," person. The strokes below. Could also represent the word person. The words of one man's mouth 
said to another man, "Make up the word, speak." What does the Buddha say? Whatever he pleases, but happy to say what he wants to say, he always speaks the Dharma. Having already become Buddhas, Shakyamuni Buddha and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions are called already enlightened ones, as they have already understood and awakened from their dreams. While we are still sound asleep and dreaming, the Buddha is greatly enlightened, greatly awakened. With his Buddha wisdom, there is nothing he does not know. Using his Buddha vision, there is nothing he does not see. This is the meaning of his great enlightenment, which came from cultivating, and this is the result to which he has certified. He has walked the road; he has been through it. He is an already enlightened one. The methods of cultivation he used to attain the fruit of enlightenment, he then teaches to lead all living beings to attain and certify to that ultimate, complete result of bodhi. This is why he speaks the Dharma, and why, having done so, he is happy to have spoken. What does he say? Right now, he speaks of Amitabha. The Buddha speaks of Amitabha Sutra. Amitabha, the next word in the title, is a Sanskrit word which means limitless light. Amitabha's other name, Amitayas, means limitless life. But, you might ask. The sutra says that it has been ten kalpas since Amitabha realized Buddhahood. Ten kalpas is a definite length of time. Why do you speak of limitless life and then measure it out in time? Amitayas, limitless life, refers to his blessings and virtue. Limitless light refers to his wisdom. His wisdom light is limitless and bright, limitless life, limitless light. Not only are his blessings, virtues, and wisdom limitless, but so are his spiritual powers, his eloquence, his attributes, and his teachings. There is no way to count them because they are infinite, nowhere present, and nowhere absent. Where did the limitless come from? Mathematicians should know that the limitless comes from the one. One is many, and many are one. A scholar once wrote a book and said, "Large numbers are written by starting with one, and then employing many place-holding zeros." Keep adding zeros until the space between heaven and earth is filled. When you have written all over your walls and covered your floors, can you determine the total? Couldn't you still add another zero? Numbers are endless. Amitabha Buddha's life, wisdom, merit, virtue, and way power. Are all infinite and unbounded. If you want a big figure, go ahead and write columns of zeros. Knowing that there can be no definite total, the Buddha, who is the perfection of intelligence, just said, "Limitless and uncountable." Mathematicians can explain infinity, and scientists have sent men into space to study it. But having arrived in empty space, there's still more empty space beyond. There's no end to it. Numbers go on infinitely, and in this way, we can understand the vast expanse of Amitabha Buddha's blessedness, his virtue, and his wisdom. Therefore, he is called Amita. 
Both the Amitabha and Shakyamuni Buddha were people who became Buddhas. They did not descend from the heavens or ascend from the depths of the earth. As people, they cultivated the Dharma, and now they are sages, people who have realized the result. According to the classification of sutra titles, this sutra is established by reference to a person. But not a person like us. He is a Buddha, one who has realized the result. We are living beings. We have not realized the result, but are cultivating the cause of Buddhahood. Once Buddhahood is realized, we will be sages. This sage's name, Amitabha, is used to classify the title of the sutra. A sutra is called a tallying text. It tallies with the wonderful principles of all Buddhas above and with the opportunities for teaching living beings below. Each time I explain a sutra, I add more meanings to the word. If I told you all of the meanings at once, you would never remember them. Or if you did, the next time I spoke about it, you would say, I know all about it. A sutra strings together, attracts, is permanent, and is a method. The master is certainly repetitious. So I explain the term sutra bit by bit. In this commentary on the Amitabha Sutra, I will discuss five of its meanings. 1. Basic Dharma The Buddha reveals the origin of Dharma with his teaching by means of four kinds of complete giving. A. Mundane Complete Giving Using Ordinary Methods of Expression B. Curative Complete Giving Curing each living being of his particular problem. C. Complete Giving that is for everyone. Teaching for the sake of all living beings. D. The Complete Giving of the Primary Meaning. Giving the Highest Principle to All Beings. Ultimately, the Dharma cannot be spoken because there is no Dharma to speak. But by practicing the four kinds of complete giving, the Buddha reveals it. Thus the word Sutra has the meaning of basic Dharma. 2. Subtle Dharma Unless the profound and wonderful doctrines are elucidated in the Sutras, no one can know of them. 3. Bubbling Spring Principles flow from sutras like gushing water from artesian wells. 4. Guideline To make guidelines, ancient carpenters and stonemasons used a string covered with black ink, held the string taut, pulled it, let it snap, and made a straight black line. A sutra is also like a compass and square, used for guiding people. 5. A garland The principles are linked together in the sutras like flowers woven into a garland. The word sutra also has four additional meanings. 1. Stringing Together Sutras string together the principles of the Buddha Dharma. 2. Attracts Sutras attract living beings who are in need of the teaching. 3. Method the methods used in cultivation which have been employed from ancient times right up until the present are set forth in the sutras. 4. Permanent Sutras are permanent and unchanging. 
not one word can be left out or added to them, and heavenly demons and non-Buddhist religions cannot harm them. The word sutra also means a path. If you wanted, for example, to go to New York and didn't know the way, you might run west instead of east. You could run all your life, but you would never get to New York. Cultivating is also like this. Unless you know the road, you may practice forever, but will never arrive at Buddhahood. Sutras are also a canon, fixed documents to rely upon when cultivating according to Dharma. Sutras also explain worldly dharmas. You can find any doctrine you wish in the sutras. Sutras are everyone's breath. Without them, men are lost. We should step outside of our stuffy rooms to breathe the fresh air of the sutras. People can't live without air or sutras. You ask. I don't study sutras or the Dharma, so I don't breathe that air, do I? You breathe it too, because the Dharma air fills the world, and whether or not you study it, you breathe it all the same. Everyone shares the air. Students of the Buddha Dharma exhale Buddha Dharma air, and non-students breathe it in. You can't avoid this relationship. Sutras are also food for the spirit, and have many uses. When you're melancholy or depressed, recite sutras, for they explain the doctrines in a wonderful way, which expels your gloom and opens your heart. Sutra is the common name of all sutras. This sutra's particular name is the Buddha speaks of Amitabha. There are many sutra names because the Buddha left limitless, unbounded Dharma jewels in the world. But of these hundreds and thousands of sutras, none go beyond the seven classifications. In order to clarify their content, sutra titles are divided into seven types by their reference to person, Dharma, and analogy. One. Single three. Three of the seven titles are established by reference to either person, dharma, or analogy. A, the Buddha speaks of Amitabha Sutra, refers only to people. Shakyamuni Buddha and Amitabha Buddha are both people who cultivated and became Buddhas. B. The Great Parinirvana Sutra is an example of a title classified by reference to a dharma. Nirvana is the dharma of non-production and non-extinction. C. The Net of Brahma Sutra is a title established only by reference to analogy. The analogy of the net of the great Brahma king. The net in the Brahma heaven has many holes in it, like a fish net, and there is a gem in every hole. Each gem radiates more brilliantly than an electric light, and they shine upon each other. Light shines upon light, reflected through the interstices of the net. They interillumine without conflict. One light, for example, would never say to another. I hate your light lamp. It's terrible. I'm the only one who can shine around here. Lamps don't fight with each other like people. The net of Brahma is an analogy for the precepts. Each precept is like a gem, and those who have left home are one of the three jewels because they keep the precepts purely. Members of the sangha cultivate to have no improper thoughts concerning their environment. Thus, they transcend the material world, attain purity, and shine like gems in the net of Brahma.
two, double three. Titles established by reference to a combination of either person and dharma, person and analogy, or dharma and analogy are called double three. D, the Sutra of Questions of Manjushri, is a title established by reference to a person, the greatly wise Bodhisattva Manjushri, and the Dharma he requested, Prajna. Only the most intelligent Bodhisattva knew to ask about the meaning of Prajna. One of great wisdom requesting the Dharma of great wisdom classifies the sutra title according to person and Dharma. E, the Lion Roar of the Thus Come One Sutra, is a title established by reference to a person, the Thus Come One, and an analogy, the Lion Roar. The Buddha speaks Dharma like the lion roars, and when the king of beasts roars, the wild beasts tremble. So, in his song of certifying to the way, the great master Yongjia wrote, "The roar of the lion is the fearless speaking. When the wild beasts hear it, their heads split wide open." Elephants run wild and lose their decorum, but gods and dragons, in silence, hear it with delight. The Buddha speaks the Dharma like the fearless lion roars. When the lion roars, the other animals are frozen with fright. Elephants are usually quite sedate, but they lose their powerful authoritarian stance. Gods, dragons. And the rest of the eightfold division, however, are delighted. F, the wonderful Dharma Lotus Blossom Sutra, is an example of a title established by reference to a Dharma and an analogy, since the wonderful Dharma is analogous to a lotus flower. Three, complete in one. The seventh classification contains references to all three subjects: person, dharma, and analogy. G, the Great Means Expansive Buddha Flower Adornment Sutra. In this sutra, great means and expansive refers to the wonderful dharma of realizing Buddhahood. Flower adornment. Is an analogy. The cause of flowers of ten thousand practices are used to adorn the supreme virtue of the fruit. In addition to the seven classifications of sutra titles, the texts comprising the entire Tripitaka, or Buddhist canon, may be divided into twelve categories. One, prose lines. Two. Repetition of the meanings presented in the prose lines in short verse lines makes the text easy to remember. Three, predictions of Buddhahood. Although future Buddhas have not yet realized Buddhahood, the present Buddha predicts their eventual accomplishment and gives them each a name. Four. Interjections do not fit with the principles which come before or after them. They arise alone, like the short verses in the Vajra Diamond Sutra. Five. The Buddha speaks of Amitabha Sutra, belongs to the category of sutras spoken without request. The sound hearer disciples were not ready to understand the doctrines of the Pure Land Dharma Door, and the Bodhisattvas hadn't conceived of this method or heard of Amitabha's vow to save all beings. Everyone said that reciting the Buddha's name was an old woman's pastime, and that those with wisdom did not need to study it. This is a serious mistake. 
because unless you recite the Buddha's name, you continue to have useless, scattered, lustful, desire-ridden thoughts. Reciting the Buddha's name gets rid of discursive thought. One who recites the name all day long will have no discursive thought. The absence of such thought is wonderful. The wonderful Dharma purges us of greed, hate, and stupidity. When I was seventeen, I wrote a verse. The king of all Dharmas is the one word, Amitabha. The five periods and the eight teachings are all contained within it. One who single-mindedly remembers and recites his name will enter into the still and bright and unmoving field. Reciting the Buddha's name is much better than all of your crazy ideas. This sutra describes the practices leading to the Buddha's pure land. Bodhisattvas didn't ask for this dharma because they simply did not understand the subtle advantages of reciting the Buddha's name. Since no one asked for this wonderful dharma, Shakyamuni Buddha spoke without request. 6. Causes and conditions are also spoken by the Buddhas. 7. Analogies 8. Past events discuss the events in the lives of the Buddha's disciples. 9. Past lives discuss the events in the past lives of the Buddha. 10. Universal writings explain principle in an especially expansive way. 11. New sutras are those which have never been spoken before. 12. Commentaries The essential message of this sutra teaches us to recite the name Namo Amitabha Buddha. Amitabha Buddha has a great affinity with living beings of the Saha world. Before realizing Buddhahood, he made 48 vows, and each one involved taking living beings to Buddhahood. At that time, he was a bhikshu named Dharma Treasury. He said, When I realize Buddhahood, I vow that living beings who recite my name will also realize Buddhahood. Otherwise, I won't either. This is similar to the vow made by Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva in the Great Compassion Heart Dharani Sutra. If anyone who recites the spiritual mantra does not obtain whatever he seeks, then this cannot be the Great Compassion Dharani. By the power of his vows, Amitabha Buddha leads all beings to rebirth in his country where they realize Buddhahood. This power attracts living beings to the land of ultimate bliss, just as a magnet attracts iron filings. If living beings do not attain enlightenment, he himself won't realize Buddhahood. Therefore, all who recite his name can realize Buddhahood. The Dharma door of reciting the Buddha's name receives those of all three faculties and accepts both the intelligent and the stupid. People with wisdom have superior faculties. Ordinary people have average faculties, and stupid people have inferior faculties. But whether one is intelligent, average, or stupid, if one recites the Buddha's name, one will definitely be born transformationally from a lotus in the land of ultimate bliss, one will not pass through the womb, but will enter a lotus flower, live in it for a while, and then realize Buddhahood. Whether you are stupid or wise, you can realize Buddhahood. You say, I don't believe you can realize Buddhahood simply by reciting the Buddha's name. It's too easy. 
It's like borrowing Amitabha's power to realize Buddhahood. You should not disbelieve this because a long time ago, Amitabha signed an agreement with us which said, After I realize Buddhahood, you can recite my name and do so as well. Since we signed our names, if we recite, we are sure to become Buddhas. Furthermore, reciting the Buddha's name establishes a firm foundation and plants good roots. For example, there was once an old man who wanted to leave home. Although he was about 70 or 80 years old, couldn't get around well, and was aware of his impending death, he thought he could easily leave home and be a high master of Buddhism. When he arrived at the garden of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary, he found that Shakyamuni Buddha had gone out to receive offerings. His disciples, the Arhats, opened their heavenly eyes and took a look at this man's past causes. Seeing that he hadn't done a single good deed in the past 80,000 great eons, they told him that he couldn't leave home. When he heard this, the old man's heart turned cold and he ran, thinking, If I can't leave home, I'll kill myself. Just as he was about to throw himself into the ocean, Shakyamuni Buddha caught him and said, What are you doing? I wanted to leave home, cried the man, but the Buddha wasn't at the garden, and the great bhikshus told me that I couldn't because I have no good roots. My life is meaningless. I'm too old to work, and no one takes care of me. I might as well be dead. Shakyamuni Buddha said, Don't throw yourself into the ocean. I'll accept you. You will? said the man. Who are you? Do you have the authority? Shakyamuni Buddha said, I am the Buddha, and those bhikshus are my disciples. None of them will object. The old man wiped his eyes and blew his nose. There's hope for me, he said. The old man's head was shaved. He became a monk and immediately certified to the first stage of our hotship. Why? When he heard that he couldn't leave home, he decided to drown himself. Although he didn't really die, he was good as dead. I've already thrown myself into the sea, he said, and relinquished all his attachment to life. He saw right through everything, won his independence, and certified to the first stage of our hotship. This bothered the bhikshus. How strange, they murmured. The man has no good roots. We wouldn't let him leave home, but the Buddha accepted him, and now he's certified to arhatship. People without good roots can't do that. Such a contradiction in the teaching will never do. Let's go ask the Buddha. Then they went to the Buddha, bowed reverently, and asked, We are basically clear-minded. How could that old man without good roots certify to our hotship? How can the Buddha Dharma be so inconsistent? Shakyamuni Buddha said, As our hots, you see only the events of the past 80,000 eons. More than 80,000 eons ago, the old man was a firewood gatherer. One day in the mountains, he was attacked by a tiger and quickly climbed a tree. The tiger leaped and snapped his jaws but missed. This tiger, however, was smarter than the average tiger. I'll show you, it said. I'll chew through the trunk of the tree, and when it falls, I'll eat you. Now, if a mouse can gnaw through wood... How much the more so can a tiger? Tigers can make powder out of human bones. It chewed halfway through the tree and terrified the old man whose life was hanging by a thread. Then he remembered. In times of danger, people recite the Buddha's name, and he called out, Namo Buddha! 
which scared the tiger away and saved his life. After that, the old man forgot to recite, and so on this side of eighty thousand great eons, he failed to plant good roots. However, the one cry of Namo Buddha was the good seed which has now ripened and allowed him to leave home and certify to the fruit. The second of the fivefold profound meanings is describing the substance. Once you know a person's name, you learn to recognize him on sight. Is he fat or thin, tall or short? You don't necessarily have to see his face, but can recognize him by his form. Oh, it's him! This sutra is a Mahayana Dharma spoken without request. And takes the real mark as its substance. The real mark is no mark. There is no mark, nothing at all, and yet there is nothing which is not marked. Unmarked is true emptiness, and with nothing unmarked, it is wonderful existence. All marks are the real mark. The real mark is unmarked, with nothing unmarked. It is without marks, and also without any non-marks. It is neither without marks, nor is it marked by no marks. While in the midst of marks, one should not hold on to marks, for they are not the real mark. True suchness. The one true Dharma realm, the thus come ones store nature. All are different names for the real mark. Unless you understand the sutra's doctrine and objective, you will not understand its principles. So now we will examine the one by means of the other. It is just like knowing a person's name and then discovering his occupation. The principles of this sutra are faith. Vows and practice holding the Buddha's name. These are the three prerequisites of the Pure Land Dharma door. One who goes on a journey takes along some food and a little money. One who wishes to go to the land of ultimate bliss needs faith, vows, and the practice of holding the Buddha's name. Faith is the first prerequisite, for without it. One will not make the vow to be born with Amitabha in the pure land of ultimate bliss, and thus will not realize the objective of this sutra. You must have faith in yourself, the land of ultimate bliss, cause and effect, and noumena and phenomena. What does it mean to believe in oneself? It is to believe that you certainly have the qualifications necessary to be born in the land of ultimate bliss. You should not take yourself lightly and say, "I have committed so many offenses; I can't be born there." If you have heavy offense karma, you now have a good opportunity to take it with you to the land of ultimate bliss. Regardless of the offenses you have committed in the past, if you change your mind and reform your conduct, you may be born there, offenses and all. Taking your karma to the pure land refers to past karma, however, not to future karma. Once you have understood the Dharma, offenses should cease. If you continue to offend, you will absolutely not be reborn in the land of ultimate bliss. You may recite the Buddha's name and bow to the Buddha, but you will only be making investments in future Buddhahood. You will not, in this life, be born in the land of ultimate bliss. Because you clearly understood and yet deliberately violated the rules of the Dharma. Before taking refuge with the triple jewel, doing things which are not in accord with the Dharma may be excusable, but to continue such behavior after taking refuge increases the gravity of one's offenses. Knowing your error, you must truly change your faults and say. I most certainly can be reborn in the land of ultimate bliss. 
Secondly, you must have faith in the Western land of ultimate bliss, which is hundreds of thousands of millions of Buddha lands from here. Before he realized Buddhahood, Amitabha Buddha, as the Bhikshu Dharma Treasury, vowed to create a land where living beings who recite his name could be born. There's no need to do anything else. It's easy, simple, and convenient. It doesn't cost a thing, and yet this Dharma door is the highest and most supreme. For if you just recite Namo Amitabha Buddha, you will be born in the land of ultimate bliss. It is also necessary to believe in cause and effect, to believe that in the past you have planted good roots which have caused you to encounter this Dharma door of faith, vows, and holding the Buddha's name. Without good roots, no one can encounter this or any other Dharma door. But, just as in planting the fields, if a farmer doesn't nourish and irrigate the fields, he won't reap the fruit. So believe that in the past you have planted the causes of Bodhi, which in the future will bear the fruit of Bodhi if you just nourish the root. You may think, You tell me to believe in cause and effect and to believe that I have good roots, but frankly I don't think I do. How can you tell whether or not you have good roots? People often ask me to tell them whether or not they have good roots, but I tell them to tell me if I have good roots. They say, I don't know if you do. And I answer them, Then how should I know about you? But I do have a method to teach you how to find out. You have met the Buddha Dharma because you have good roots. Without them, you would not have had this opportunity. Granted, I have met the Buddha Dharma, you say, but is it possible that I have no good roots? If you lack them, plant them. If you don't plant them, you will never have any. Whether or not you have good roots is no great problem. The question is whether or not you will plant and nourish them by cultivating according to the Dharma. For example, the Buddha Dharma teaches you not to drink, but you would risk your life to do it. Drunk, with your head confused and your eyes blurry, your brain feels as if it were going to split open. This is to walk down the road of stupidity. The Buddha Dharma teaches you not to steal, but even if your life were not at stake, you'd steal. One who truly cultivates according to Dharma does not lie, drink, steal, kill, or commit acts of sexual misconduct. Obey the Buddha and refrain from evil. Do not think that minor faults are unimportant, for it's just the minor faults that drag one into the hells or into the paths of hungry ghosts or animals. Believe, then, that you have good roots, and that in the future you will reap the fruit of Bodhi. Finally, one must have faith in the phenomena and the noumena of the Amitabha Sutra. The specific phenomena is this. Amitabha Buddha has a great affinity with us and will certainly guide us to Buddhahood. The noumenal principle is this. We know the great affinity exists because without it we would not have met the Pure Land Dharma door. Amitabha Buddha is all living beings and all living beings are Amitabha Buddha. Amitabha Buddha became Amitabha Buddha by reciting the Buddha's name, and if we recite the Buddha's name, we too can become Amitabha Buddha. We should cultivate according to the phenomenal and the noumenal principles. The Avatamsaka Sutra speaks of four Dharma realms. One, the Dharma realm of unobstructed phenomena. 
Two, the Dharma realm of unobstructed noumena. Three, the Dharma realm of noumena and phenomena unobstructed. Four, the Dharma realm of all phenomena unobstructed. Considering the four Dharma realms and speaking from the standpoint of our self nature, we and Amitabha Buddha are united in one, and therefore we have the qualifications to realize Buddhahood. The phenomenon has a mark and a manifestation; it is conditioned. The noumenon is the doctrine underlying any phenomenal event. For example, in principle. A tree has the potential to become a house. Before the house is built, it has that noumenal aspect. Once built, the house itself is the phenomenon, which appears because of the noumenon. In principle, we can all realize Buddhahood, but we have not phenomenally done so. If we have faith, vows, and hold the name. We will arrive at the phenomena of Buddhahood, just as the tree can be made into a house. Amitabha Buddha is contained within the hearts of all living beings, and living beings are contained within Amitabha's heart. This is the phenomenon and the noumenon. You must believe in the doctrine and energetically practice it by reciting the Buddha's name more and more every day. When one recites Namo Amitabha Buddha in the Western Land of Ultimate Bliss, in one of the pools of the Seven Jewels filled with the Eight Waters of Merit and Virtue, a lotus flower grows. The more one recites, the bigger it grows, but it won't bloom until the end of life, when one's self nature goes to be reborn in it. If you wish to know whether you will be born in a superior, Middle or inferior grade of lotus, you should ask yourself how often you recite the Buddha's name. The more you recite, the bigger the lotus; the less you recite, the smaller. If you don't recite at all, the lotus withers and dies. To be reborn in the land of ultimate bliss, you must personally give proof to the result with deep faith. Firm vows and actual practice of recitation. It won't work to think. I'll sleep in today and cultivate tomorrow. If, however, you hold fast to the name and cultivate vigorously, success is certain. Having discussed faith, we will now discuss vows. What is a vow? What you wish. The tendency of your thoughts is a vow. In Buddhism, there are four great vows. I vow to save the limitless living beings. I vow to cut off the inexhaustible afflictions. I vow to study the immeasurable Dharma doors. I vow to realize the supreme Buddha way. All Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the past, present, and future practice the Bodhisattva conduct and attain Buddhahood by relying on these four great vows. You may make the four great vows according to the four holy truths. According to the truth of suffering, I vow to save the limitless living beings. According to the truth of origination, I vow to cut off the inexhaustible afflictions. According to the truth of the way, I vow to study the immeasurable Dharma doors. According to the truth of extinction, I vow to realize the supreme Buddha way. The four great vows come from an awareness of the suffering of living beings. For purposes of clarification, suffering is divided into groups of three, eight, and limitless sufferings. 
According to the truth of origination, I vow to cut off the inexhaustible afflictions. The three sufferings are: one, suffering within suffering. This is the poverty and misery of all living beings. Two, the suffering of decay. Living beings may enjoy wealth and honor, but it eventually goes bad. Three, the suffering of process. Even without the sufferings of poverty and decay, the bitterness of the life processes from birth to the prime of life, to old age, and then to death is still suffering. The shift and change of each passing thought is called the suffering of process. The eight sufferings are: one, the suffering of birth; two, the suffering of old age; three, the suffering of sickness; four, the suffering of death. It was because Shakyamuni Buddha met with these four sufferings that he decided to leave the home life and cultivate the way. Five, the suffering of separation from what you love. Six, the suffering of being joined with what you hate. If people are not apart from loved ones, they are involved with enemies. If you don't like someone, you'll find someone just like him wherever you go. Seven. The suffering of not realizing aspirations. You worry about getting something, and once you have it, you worry about losing it. This suffering is nothing compared to the next. Eight, the suffering of the raging blaze of the five skandhas. Form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, and consciousness. The five skandhas are like a raging fire; they are a constant shadow which we cannot escape. According to the truth of suffering, I vow to save the limitless living beings. Why are there limitless sufferings besides these eight? In past lives, we planted the seeds of suffering as if they were old friends with which we were loath to part. Having established causes and conditions for suffering in the past, in the present, we reap a bitter fruit. From causes made in lives gone by comes your present life. Results you'll get in lives to come. Arise from this life's deeds. Plant good causes, reap good results. Plant bad causes, reap bad results. You fear the results. Oh, I'm suffering so bitterly, you say. But you suffer because previously you planted the causes of suffering. Living beings fear the results, not the causes from which they come, but bodhisattvas fear the causes, not the result. Bodhisattvas are extremely careful not to plant the causes of suffering, and so they do not reap the harvest of suffering. They endure their past suffering gladly. So bodhisattvas too must sometimes suffer, but they do so willingly, knowing that enduring suffering ends suffering, enjoying blessings destroys blessings. Living beings, on the other hand, are not afraid to plant the causes of suffering. Good causes, bad causes, it doesn't matter. They say, "I'll do it anyway. It's not important." But when the results come, oh, I can't stand it! They moan. How could this happen to me? 
such bitterness. If you fear suffering, you should not plant the causes of suffering. For if you do, you will certainly reap its bitter fruit. Born in the land of ultimate bliss, one endures no suffering but enjoys every bliss. None of the three sufferings, eight sufferings, or the limitless sufferings are found there at all. The people are pure and free of greed, hatred, and stupidity. Without the three poisons, there are no evil paths of rebirth, because the evil paths are but manifestations of the poisons. The Buddha saved living beings, but in reality, there is not a single living being that he saves. He resolves to lead everyone to understand the Buddha Dharma in order to leave suffering, attain bliss, and wake up. But when you take beings across, do not become attached to the mark of taking beings across. Take living beings across. But be apart from marks. Leave marks, yet take beings across. Do not attach to some mark or sign of what you do and say. Let's see. I've saved three, four, six, seven, at least ten living beings. If you keep count. You've still got attachments. Save yet do not save. Do not save yet save. This is true. Crossing over. You must save the living beings within your own self nature as well as those outside. There are eighty-four thousand living beings in your self-nature. Teach them to cultivate, realize Buddhahood, and enter Nirvana. If you decide to save living beings, you will encounter afflictions. If you don't save them, you will also have afflictions. Either way, you will have afflictions because there are eighty-four thousand kinds of afflictions. There are three delusions. One, delusions of views and thought. Two, delusions like dust and sand. Three, delusions of ignorance. Living beings have all three types of delusions. Those of the small vehicle have cut off the delusions of views and thought. But retain the delusions like dust and sand, and the delusions of ignorance. Bodhisattvas have cut off the delusions of views and thought, and the delusions like dust and sand, but they still have delusions of ignorance. Even bodhisattvas at the stage of equal enlightenment, who are just about to realize Buddhahood. Still, have one particle of production mark, ignorance, as fine as a hair, which they have not yet destroyed. Once this particle is destroyed, they attain the wonderful enlightenment of Buddhahood. The delusions of views refers to greed and love for externals, because external objects are not viewed as empty; they are recognized as real. Clothing, food, and sleep seem very real. It's true, you say. I'm all alone. I have no friends or relatives. This confused state is the delusion of views. Not understanding what you see, you are greedy for comfort and good things. I love this, and I love that. You say, and your endless love keeps you dissatisfied and greedy for externals. This is the delusion of views. The delusion of thought consists in being confused about principles and giving rise to discrimination. 
I don't know what's going on here," someone says. "Is the Dharma master right? If I do what he says, what's in it for me? You constantly calculate about personal advantage, and if there's nothing in it for you, you don't want to do it. You can't see more than three inches beyond your face. Anything four inches away, you cannot see. Thought delusions are unclear, muddled thoughts, taking what is wrong as right and what is right as wrong. I just said that people with view delusions think clothing, food, and sleep are real. Someone may ask if they are false, and if so, then what is true? These things are all necessities, but if you attach no importance to them, you are relaxed and free. Whenever there is attachment, there is pain. If you take it all as unreal, there will be no greed or love, and you will see that your former greed and love were nothing but confused actions in a dream. You should think of them in this way: put everything down, let it all go. If you can't put it down, you're attached, and nothing goes right. There are eighty-eight parts to the delusion of views, and eighty-one parts to the delusion of thought. When the delusion of views is destroyed, you certify to the first fruit of arhatship. If not, there is no certification. Do you have greed and love for externals? Are you greedy for good things? And repulsed by the bad? Absolutely not, you say. How do you know you are not? If you really didn't love the good and hate the bad, you wouldn't know it. If you say, "I know for certain that I have no greed or love," then your greed and love is greater than anyone else's. Why? Because you know. That you have none. If you really had none, you wouldn't know that you didn't. If you say that you have no self, how do you know that you have no self? Knowing that you have no self, you still have your self. If you say that you have no greed or love, you still have a self, and you haven't cut off the eighty-eight parts of the delusion of views. And haven't certified to the first fruit of our hotship. It is not simply a matter of saying it and making it so. You must truly attain the state. The delusion of views contains the five quick servants, and the delusion of thought contains the five dull servants. The five dull servants are greed. Hatred, stupidity, pride, and doubt. The five quick servants are said to be quick because they arrive very fast. The five dull servants arrive more slowly. The five quick servants are: one, the view of a body. Because one is attached, one thinks. This is my body, and I'm so thin. I'm not eating right. I'm not properly dressed, and I don't have a decent place to live. How can I take care of my body? Attached to the body and holding a view of a body, one schemes for it all day long. Two, the view of extremes. To become attached to either of the two extreme views of permanence or annihilationism is to indulge in this view. Attached to annihilationism, one says, "People die, and that is that. Everything returns to emptiness." Attached to permanence, one says, "Next life, I'll be a person again." People are always people, and dogs are always dogs. Cats are always cats. 
Horses are always horses. Trees are always trees. Grass is always grass. People can't become cats, and cats can't turn into people. People can't turn into animals or ghosts. This is the fixed, eternal, unchanging principle: permanence. Annihilationism and permanence are extreme views. They are not the middle way. Three, deviant views. Those with deviant views say that when one does good, there is no good retribution, and when one does evil, there is no evil retribution. They deny cause and effect and do not believe that by doing good deeds one obtains blessings, and by doing evil deeds one incurs disasters. Four, the views of restrictive morality. This is to take a non-existent cause for a true cause. For example, teaching others to imitate the conduct of dogs and cats, or to imitate cows and eat grass instead of food. Having seen a dog or cat reborn in the heavens, one may want to imitate a dog or cat and thereby hold deviant knowledge and views. Sometimes people who have left the home life are attached to keeping the precepts. I hold the precepts. They brag. I am a precept holder, and these are the precepts I hold. Because there is a holder and that which is held, they do not understand that the basic substance of morality is empty. They shouldn't have attachments, but they do. And this turns into this servant. Five, the view of grasping at views. Here, a non-existent effect is taken to be a true effect. The non-ultimate is considered to be ultimate. The four dhyanas or the four stations of emptiness are mistaken for nirvana. A. In the first dhyana, the pulse stops. B, in the second dhyana, the breath stops. One sits without breathing, but if one thinks, "I'm not breathing," then the breath starts up again. C, in the third dhyana, there is no thought. In the first and second, although there is neither pulse nor breath. Thinking continues. In the third, there isn't even any thought. D. In the fourth dhyana, there isn't any fine thought, only consciousness. In the third dhyana, although there is no coarse thought, fine thought remains. In the fourth, fine thought is also cut off. These are just states. They are not the ultimate goal of cultivation, which is certification to the fruit. Even the four stations of emptiness. One, the station of infinite space. Two, the station of infinite consciousness. Three, the station of nothing whatever. And four. The station of neither perception nor non-perception are not certification to the fruit; they are simply levels of samadhi. Those who hold the view of grasping at views think that the above-mentioned states are nirvana, like the untutored bhikshu who mistook the fourth dhyana heaven for the fourth fruit of arhatship. When the merit which had enabled him to dwell there was used up. And he started to fall. He slandered the Dharma, and because of this, he fell into the hells. The five quick servants are the delusions of views, and are called quick because they arrive quickly. Referring to the delusion of thought and arriving more slowly, 
are the five dull servants. One, greed. Two, hatred. Three, stupidity. Four, pride. Five, doubt. Afflictions come from ignorance. When the delusions of ignorance arise, delusions like dust and sand follow. The delusions like dust and sand are all called the delusions of "I don't know," because there is no genuine knowledge. The delusions of views and thought are called the delusions of "I don't see." Ignorance turns into the first of the five dull servants, greed. When you want something, greed arises, and with it comes all the various afflictions. The afflictions turn into hatred, and you argue on your own behalf, never seeing the other person's side. You only know yourself and are unaware that other people exist, except in attempting to ruin them. In this way, reckless and unreasonable, you become stupid, unable to tell black from white, right from wrong. Stupid people are arrogant, and no matter what you say, they doubt it. They doubt the truth and doubt the false even more. All these doubts are the delusions of thought. The three categories of delusions. Those of views and thought, dust and sand, and ignorance, all change into afflictions. Afflictions are inexhaustible and endless. Observing this, cultivators vow, according to the truth of origination, I vow to cut off the inexhaustible afflictions. According to the truth of the way. I vow to study the immeasurable Dharma doors. To cultivate the way, you must understand all of the limitless and unbounded Dharma doors, which are the methods of cultivation. Unless you understand them, you cannot cultivate. Relying on the third holy truth, the way, vow to study them. What is the origin of all Dharma doors? The Buddhas spoke all dharmas for the minds of men. If there were no minds, what use would dharmas be? All dharmas come from the minds of living beings, and each mind is unique. Since no two minds are alike, all dharma doors differ. Generally speaking, however, there are three classes of dharmas. One, Buddha dharma. Two. Mind Dharma, three, Dharma of living beings. Within the three classes arise the four holy truths, the six perfections, the twelve causes and conditions, and the thirty-seven limbs of enlightenment. So many Dharma doors. Take for example my explanations of the sutras. When I finish explaining one sutra, I begin another, and no sooner have I finished that one that I start yet another one. Isn't this measureless? What we now study is like a drop of water in the sea. We certainly haven't got the entire ocean. Vow to master the immeasurable Dharma doors. What are the advantages of studying the Buddha Dharma? You ask. It's a lot of trouble, you know. We study the Buddha Dharma because we want to realize Buddhahood. But isn't wanting to realize Buddhahood just another false thought? No, it's not a false thought. Buddhahood was our position to begin with. It is our origin. Consequently, everyone can realize Buddhahood, and we should hurry up and do just that. But how? According to the truth of extinction, I vow to realize the supreme Buddha way. 
The truth of extinction is the attainment of nirvana, a realization which carries one beyond production and extinction. If this attainment is your wish, resolve to cultivate the supreme Buddha way. Don't be skeptical and ask, "Can I really become a Buddha?" Even if you have doubts, you can become a Buddha. It will take a little longer. That's all. Without doubts, you can do it right away. All living beings have the Buddha nature, and all can realize Buddhahood. But this does not mean that all beings are Buddhas. To arrive at Buddhahood, you must cultivate. For without cultivation, living beings are just living beings, not Buddhas. In principle, everyone can become a Buddha, but unless you cultivate according to Dharma and rid yourself of greed, hatred, stupidity, pride, and doubt, you won't become a Buddha very fast. This completes the discussion of the four vast vows. If you wish to accomplish something, you should first make a vow, then act upon it. In this way, you will naturally attain your aim. This principle is illustrated by the following story. Once, Shakyamuni Buddha and his disciple Madhagalayana. Went with a large gathering of followers to another country to convert living beings. When the citizens saw the Buddha, they shut their doors and ignored him. When they saw Madhagalayana, however, they ran to greet him, and everyone, from the king and ministers to the citizens, all bowed and competed to make offerings to him. The Buddha's disciples thought this most unfair. World honored one. They said, "Your virtuous conduct is so lofty. Why is it that they do not make offerings to you, but instead compete to make offerings to Madhagalayana? This is because of past affinities," said the Buddha. "I will tell you. Limitless eons ago, Madhagalayana and I were fellow countrymen. He gathered firewood in the mountains, and I lived in a hut below." A swarm of bees was bothering me, and I decided to smoke them out. But Madhagalayana refused to help, even though they stung him until his hands were swollen and painful. Instead, he made a vow. It must be miserable to be a bee, he thought. I vow that when I attain the way, I will take these Ashura-like bees across first thing. Many lifetimes later, the bees were reborn as the citizens of this country. The queen bee became the king, the drones became the ministers, and the workers became the citizens. Because I didn't like the bees, I now have no affinities with these people, and therefore no one makes offerings to me. But because of his vows, all the citizens revere Madhagalayana. Considering this, we should certainly make vows to establish affinities in order to benefit living creatures. When the water-clearing pearl is tossed in muddy water, the muddy water becomes clear. When the Buddha's name enters a confused mind, the confused mind attains to the Buddha. This sutra takes faith, vows, and holding the name as its doctrine. Having discussed faith and vows, we shall now discuss holding the name. Reciting the Buddha's name is like throwing a pearl into muddy water so that the muddy water becomes clear. This clear water pearl can purify even the filthiest water. Recitation of the Buddha's name is like this pearl. Who can count the false thoughts which fill our minds and succeed one another endlessly like waves on the sea? When the Buddha's name enters a confused mind, the confused mind becomes the Buddha. 
Recite the name once, and there is one Buddha in your mind. Recite it ten times, and there are ten Buddhas. Recite it a hundred times, and there are a hundred Buddhas. The more you recite, the more Buddhas there are. Say Namo Amitabha Buddha. There is a Buddha thought in your mind. When you are mindful of the Buddha, the Buddha is mindful of you. It's like communication by radio or radar. You recite here, and it's received there. But if you don't recite, nothing is received. So you must hold and recite the name. In the Dharma ending age, recitation of the Buddha's name is a most important Dharma door. Don't take it lightly. Every time Dhyana Master Yongming Shou, the sixth patriarch of the Pure Land School, recited the Buddha's name, a transformation Buddha came out of his mouth. Those with the five eyes and six spiritual penetrations could see it. When you recite the Buddha's name, you emit a light which frightens all weird creatures and strange ghosts away. They run far, far away and leave you alone. So the merit and virtue of holding the Buddha's name is inconceivable. Holding and reciting the Buddha's name, you should, as it says in the Doctrine of the Mean, grasp it tightly in your fist. Do not let it go. Thought after thought, recite the name. There are four methods of reciting. One, contemplating and thinking Buddha recitation. Two, contemplating an image Buddha recitation. Three, real mark Buddha recitation. Four, holding the name Buddha recitation. The first, contemplating and thinking Buddha recitation. Consists of the contemplation of Amitabha Buddha. Amitabha Buddha's body is of golden hue; his fine marks radiant beyond compare. His white light is as high as five Mount Sumerus; his purple eyes as clear and vast as four great seas. Countless transformation Buddhas appear within the light, with transformation Bodhisattvas also limitless. His forty-eight vows take living beings across. In nine grades of lotuses, they ascend to the other shore. Amitabha Buddha's appearance is the result of the perfection of his merit and virtue. He has all of the thirty-two marks and the eighty minor characteristics of a Buddha, and his bright light is incomparable. Between his eyebrows, there are fine white beams of light as big as five Mount Sumerus, and his eyes are as large as four great seas. How big do you think his body is? There are nine grades of lotuses. One, superior, superior. Two, superior, middle. Three, superior, inferior. Four, middle, superior. Five, middle, middle. Six, middle inferior. Seven, inferior superior. Eight, inferior middle. Nine, inferior inferior. Each of the nine grades also has nine ranks, making eighty-one in all. Living beings in all of these grades are led to the other shore, nirvana. The second kind of Buddha recitation, contemplating the image, 
consists of making offerings to an image of Amitabha Buddha, and reciting his name while contemplating it. Contemplate, and in time you will have success. When you achieve the third, real mark recitation, even if you try, you cannot stop reciting the Buddha's name. The recitation flows like water and lives within you. This is the state of the Buddha recitation samadhi, reciting and yet not reciting, not reciting and yet reciting. The fourth kind of Buddha recitation is that of holding the name. Both moving and still, one recites, Namo Amitabha Buddha. Recitation must be clear and distinct. And the three karmas of body, mouth, and mind must be pure. The mouth is free from the four evil karmas of one, abusive language, two, profanity, three, lying, and four, gossip. And the body is without the three evil karmas of five, killing. Six, stealing, or seven, sexual misconduct. The mind has no eight, greed, nine, hatred, or ten, stupidity. When one is free of the ten evil deeds, then the karma of body, mouth, and mind is pure. In this way. One thought pure is one thought of the Buddha. When every thought is pure, every thought is of the Buddha. The pure heart is like the moon in the water. The mind in samadhi is like the cloudless sky. If you can recite so completely that you enter the Buddha recitation samadhi. Then hearing the wind, it's Namo Amitabha Buddha, and hearing the rain, it's Namo Amitabha Buddha. Every sound you hear recites the Buddha's name. The water flows, the wind blows, proclaiming the Mahayana. The Chinese poet Su Dongpo said. Of the colors of the mountain, none are not his vast long tongue. Of the sounds of the streams, all are the clear, pure sound. All the mountain's colors are the Buddha's long tongue, proclaiming the wonderful Dharma. This is the attainment of the Buddha recitation samadhi. So I wrote this verse. If you recite the Buddha's name, reciting without cease, the mouth recites Amita and makes things of a piece. Scattered thoughts do not arise. Samadhi you attain. For rebirth in the pure land, your hope is not in vain. If all day you detest the sufferings of Saha's pain, make rebirth in ultimate bliss your mind's essential aim. Cut off the red dust thoughts within your mind. Put down impure reflections, and pure thoughts you will find. Recite the Buddha's name from morning to night. And your confused thoughts will not arise. You will naturally attain the Buddha recitation samadhi and be reborn in the land of ultimate bliss according to your will. You know that the Saha world is full of pain and suffering, so cut off worldly pleasures and have no thoughts of sexual desire, craving, or struggling for fame and profit. Put down all worldly concerns and view them as false. Seek for rebirth in ultimate bliss. This thought of rebirth is extremely important. 
The verse clearly explains the principles of reciting the Buddha's name. Holding and reciting the name is like picking up something in your hand and never letting it go. Recite, Namo Amitabha Buddha, every day and chase out your scattered thoughts. This Dharma door fights poison with poison. False thinking is like poison, and unless you counter it with poison, you will never cure it. Reciting the Buddha's name is fighting false thinking with false thinking. It is like sending out an army to defeat an army, to fight a battle to end all battles. If you have a good defense, other countries won't attack. Constant recitation drives out false thinking so that you may attain the Buddha recitation samadhi. The third of the fivefold profound meanings then is to take faith, vows, and holding the name as the doctrine. The fourth of the fivefold profound meanings is to determine the sutra's power and use. Its power is that of non-retreat, and in use in rebirth. Reborn in the land of ultimate bliss, you attain to the stage of no retreat. Cultivators of other dharma doors are somewhat insecure. No one assures them. They may recite mantras or sutras for several years, and then retreat with a feeling of no accomplishment or gain. If not in this life, they may retreat in the next. Perhaps they are vigorous now, but later they take a rest. To say nothing of common people, even our huts have the confusion of dwelling in the womb, and forget their spiritual penetrations. Bodhisattvas have the confusion called splitting the yin, which means the same thing. If they meet a good-knowing advisor who teaches them to cultivate, they can wake up. Otherwise, life after life, they retreat and find it very hard to bring forth the Bodhi heart again. It is easy to regress. Born in the land of ultimate bliss, there is no backsliding, just vigorous progress. One attains the four kinds of non-retreat. One, non-retreating position. Born in the land of ultimate bliss, you attain the Buddha position. Born by transformation from a lotus, when the flower blooms, you see the Buddha, hear the Dharma, awaken to the unproduced Dharma patience, and never fall again. Two, non-retreating conduct. Most people cultivate vigorously for one life, but in the next, they are lazy. In the land of ultimate bliss, there is none of the sufferings of the three evil paths. The Kalavinka birds and the two-headed birds all help Amitabha Buddha speak about the Dharma. Reborn there, one will no longer be lazy in conduct, but will only go forward with courage and vigor. Three, non-retreating thought. In the Saha world, we cultivate vigorously, but after a time, we feel it's too bitter, too restrictive, too uncomfortable, and so we are no longer vigorous. Lazy thoughts arise, and although we have not yet retreated in conduct, we have in thought. Several decades pass quickly, and thoughts of retreat greatly outnumber those of vigor. It's difficult not to regress. In the land of ultimate bliss, one hears the Dharma spoken all day and all night long. One has no thoughts of retreat from the Bodhi mind. All thoughts are irreversible. Four. Ultimate non-retreat. Transformationally born from a lotus, you will never, under any circumstances, retreat again either to the level of a common person, 
or to the small vehicle or bodhisattva level. Born in the land of ultimate bliss, you obtain these four kinds of non-retreat. The Tripitaka is divided into three parts. Sutras, which deal with samadhi. Shastras, which deal with wisdom. And Vinaya, which deals with morality. This text belongs to the Sutra division, and as such it is permanent and unchanging. Two characteristics of Sutras. When all other Buddha Dharmas have become extinct, this Sutra will remain in the world an additional hundred years and save limitless living beings. For this reason, it differs from other Sutras. Of the three vehicles, Shravakas, conditionally enlightened ones, and Bodhisattvas, this Sutra belongs to the Bodhisattva vehicle It takes across bodhisattvas suited to the great vehicle. Knowing the sutra's title classification and its fivefold profound meanings, we now have a general understanding of the Buddha speaks of Amitabha Sutra. Sutra, translated by Tripitaka Master Kumarajiva of Yao Qin. Commentary Yao Qin is the name of the reign period of Emperor Yao Xing. It is not the same period as that of Qin Shi Huang, called the Ying Qing, or that of Fu Jian, who is called Fu Qin. Before the time of Emperor Yao Xing, and during the time of Fu Jian, a man Qin Tian Jian said to Fu Jian, Now one of great wisdom should come to China to aid our government. Fu Jian said, It's probably Kumarajiva, for he is honored and respected in India for his wisdom. Kumarajiva's father, Kumarayana, was the son of a prime minister. He should have succeeded his father, but instead he left his home and went everywhere looking for a teacher. Although he hadn't left the home life in the formal sense by taking the complete precepts, he still cultivated the way and in his travels went to the country of Kucha in Central Asia. The king of Kucha had a little sister and where she saw Kumarayana, she said to the king, I really love this man. The king gave his sister in marriage to Kumarayana and she soon became pregnant. When Kumarajiva was still in his mother's womb, it was much like the situation with Shariputra and his mother. Kumarajiva's mother could defeat everyone in debate. At that time an arhat said, The child in this woman's womb is certainly one of great wisdom. When Kumarajiva was seven years old, his mother took him to a temple to worship the Buddha. Kumarajiva picked up a large bronze incense urn and effortlessly lifted it over his head. Then he thought, Hey, I'm just a child. How can I lift this heavy urn? And with this one thought, the urn crashed to the ground. From this he realized the meaning of the doctrine, Everything is made from the mind alone. And he and his mother left the home life. Kumarajiva's mother had difficulty leaving the home life. Although Kumarajiva's father had previously cultivated the way, he was now too much in love with his wife to permit her to leave home. Thereupon, she went on a strict fast. Unless you allow me to leave home, She said, I won't eat or drink. I'll starve myself. Then don't eat or drink if that's what you want, said her husband. But I'll never let you leave home. For six days, she didn't eat or drink, not even fruit juice, and she became extremely weak. Finally, Kumarayana said, This is too dangerous. 
you're going to starve to death. You may leave home, but please eat something. First, call in a dharma master to cut off my hair, she said, and then I'll eat. A dharma master came and shaved her head, and then she ate. Shortly after leaving home, she certified to the first fruit of our hot ship. Soon after that, Kumarajiva, her son, also left the home life. Every day he read and recited many sutras, and once he read them, he never forgot them. He was not like some of you who have recited the Shurangama mantra for several months but still need the book. Because of his faultless memory, he defeated all non Buddhist philosophers in India and became very well known. His reputation spread to China, and when Fu Jian heard of him, he sent the great general Lu Guang and 70,000 troops to Kucha to capture Kumarajiva and bring him back to China. Kumarajiva said to the king of Kucha, China is sending troops, but do not oppose them. They don't wish to take the country, they have another purpose. And you should grant them their request. The king's uncle wouldn't listen to Kumarajiva, and he went to war with the general from China, Lu Guang. As a result, the king of Kucha was put to death, the country defeated, and Kumarajiva captured. On the way back to China, General Lu Guang one day prepared to camp in a low valley. Kumarajiva, who had spiritual powers, knew a rain was coming which would flood the valley. He told the general, Don't camp here tonight. This place is dangerous. But Lu Guang had no faith in Kumarajiva. You're a monk, he said. What do you know about military affairs? That night there was a deluge, and many men and horses were drowned. General Lu Guang then knew that Kumarajiva was truly inconceivable. They proceeded until they heard that there had been a change in the Chinese government. Emperor Fu Jian had been deposed, and Yao Chang had seized the throne. General Lu Guang maintained his neutrality and did not return to China. Yao Chang was emperor for several years, and when he died, His nephew Yao Xing took the throne. It was Yao Xing who dispatched a party to invite Kumarajiva to China to translate sutras. A gathering of over 800 bhikshus assembled to assist him in this work. We have proof that Kumarajiva's translations are extremely accurate. When he was about to complete the stillness, that is, die, he said, I have translated numerous sutras during my lifetime, and I personally don't know if my translations are correct. If they are, when I am cremated, my tongue will not burn. But if there are mistakes, it will. When he died, his body was burned, but his tongue remained intact. The Tang Dynasty Vinaya Master Dao Xuan once asked the god Lu Xuan Chang, Why does everyone prefer to read and study Kumarajiva's translations? The god replied, Kumarajiva has been the translation master for the past seven Buddhas, and so his translations are accurate. The Tripitaka is the collection of Buddhist scriptures. It is divided into three parts. Sutras, which deal with samadhi, shastras, which deal with wisdom, and the vinaya, which is the study of moral precepts. A Dharma Master 1. Takes the Dharma as his master, and 2. Gives the Dharma to others. Some Dharma Masters chant sutras. Some maintain them in their minds and practice them with their bodies. Some write them out, and some explain them to others. The Dharma master spoken of here is Kumarajiva. 
This Sanskrit name means "youth of long life." One could say, "Young Kumarajiva will certainly live to a great age." One could also say, "He is young in years, but mature in wisdom, eloquence, and virtue. He has the wisdom of an old old man, and so he is called youth of long life." It was Kumarajiva, the youth with virtuous conduct of an elder, who translated the Buddha speaks of Amitabha Sutra from Sanskrit into Chinese. All sutras may be divided into three parts: one, the preface; two, the principle proper; and three, the transmission. The preface discusses the sutra's general meaning, the principle proper discusses its doctrines, and the transmission instructs us to transmit the sutra, to propagate it and make it flow like water everywhere. The preface is like a person's head, and the principle proper is like his body. Just as our organs are very clearly arranged within our bodies. So are the doctrines clearly set forth within the sutras. The preface may also be called the afterword. Isn't that a contradiction? You ask. It is not a contradiction because it wasn't spoken by Shakyamuni Buddha himself, but was added later when Ananda Mahakashapa edited the sutras. It may also be called the arising of Dharma preface, because it sets forth the reasons the sutra was spoken. It is also called the certification of faith preface, because it proves that the sutra can be believed. In the preface, six requirements are fulfilled. They are: one, faith; two, hearer; three. Time, four, host, five, place, and six, audience. Sutra. Thus, I have heard at one time the Buddha dwelt at Shravasti in the Jeti Grove in the garden of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary, together with a gathering of great bhikshus. Twelve hundred fifty in all, all great arhats whom the assembly knew and recognized. Commentary. Thus, fulfills the requirement of faith. I have heard, fulfills the requirement of the hearer. At one time, fulfills the requirement of time. And the Buddha is the host. Shravasti in the garden of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary fulfills the requirement of place. The gathering of great bhikshus fulfills the audience requirement. Because all six requirements are fulfilled. We know that the sutra can be believed. Thus, I have heard. What does "thus" mean? Thus, fills the requirement of faith. You can have faith in Dharma, which is thus, not in Dharma, which is not thus. Thus designates the text as orthodox Buddha Dharma. Thus, means it is thus. Thus, is stillness. It is denotes movement. If it is thus, it is. If it is not thus, it is not. Whatever is not non-existent exists. Whatever is without error is correct. Thus means still and unmoving. Thus, 
is true emptiness. It is is wonderful existence. Wonderful existence is not apart from true emptiness. True emptiness is not apart from wonderful existence. Emptiness and existence are non-dual. Both empty and existing, neither empty nor existing. This dharma can be believed. The words "Thus I have heard" begin all Buddhist sutras. It is thus. If it were not thus, it would not be correct. This is the doctrine and dharma which is thus can be believed. I have heard. Ananda says that he himself personally heard this teaching, but having given proof to the fruit of arhatship, basically Ananda has no ego. How can he say, "I have heard"? This is the self of no self. Ananda says, "I have heard," in order to be comprehensible to ordinary people who have a self. Heard, feels the accomplishment of the hearer. Why does one have faith? Because one has heard. If one hadn't heard, how could one have faith?